Welcome to the Inside Carolina podcast. I'm your host, Tommy Ashley. We're sponsored by Johnny T-Shirt and johnnytshirt.com. This is a special podcast. We've got a lot to talk about. Again, Inside Carolina podcast, Johnny T-Shirt, johnnytshirt.com. I've got Greg Barnes with me, but I've also got a special guest, Ron Smith. He is the author of The Tar Heels. And when I say he's the author of The Tar Heels, he is the author of the book about Carolina basketball. And this is just one volume, folks. And Ron will certainly share. Ron, how you doing? Great. Doing great. Love this weather. Love, love this time of year. Baseball, football. Can't beat it. I know, right? You can watch baseball, hockey, football, and basketball on, you know, within minutes of each other. This time of year is certainly great. Great. It is. <clears throat> With that comes Carolina basketball starting up here shortly so we wanted to take time Dale Talbert reached out to me and said we've got a book coming out and this was several months ago and um, we'd love for Inside Carolina to do a podcast or radio radio show about it and I'd love for you to have the author on and want to send you the book so you can check it out and get it done and I said let's do it closer to basketball season let me ask the question um, that the first thing I thought of when I saw the book is how in the world have you managed to put together such a um, complex and thorough history of the Tar Heels in this first volume? Well, it didn't happen overnight, as you can imagine. Um, I, um, I guess the best place to start would be Back in, it was 15 years ago, 2005, um, my uh, late wife was doing treatment at Duke uh, for cancer. And we were in Barnes and Noble one day and you talk about the size of the book and the, and the, how many pages and those kind of things. Well, we were in Barnes and Noble and I saw a book that Bill Wyman, the bass player for the Rolling Stones, had put together, and it was exactly the same size, same number of pages. And what he had done since day one with the Stones going back to 62 was saved pretty much everything. Um, Posters, ticket stubs, photos, programs, just, and had the coolest, it was the coolest book I'd ever seen, just full of memorabilia and photos and stories and I just remember I I told a friend later in the summer about I said you know wouldn't it really be cool if somebody did nobody's ever done anything like this on a sports team Uh, you know I looked as far as Kentucky basketball Alabama football uh, the Yankees the Red Sox the Dodgers the Packers any iconic team nobody's ever done this this really large, um, you know, team pictures, memorabilia. And his response was, well, why don't you do it? And I said, well, you're crazy. <laughs> I could never, I could never do anything like that. Um, but what I had done was I had saved a lot of stuff since I was a kid. And it started when I was in the fourth grade where I, my dad would, would, um, he would take me to games and, we were at the North South doubleheader in Charlotte. I grew up in Charlotte and he, on this night, uh, he took his camera with him and had color film in it. And not only that, he had, he had his flash. It was like an old camera and I was getting coach Smith's autograph and he took a picture of me getting coach Smith's autograph. And that is in the book. And it's a, just an incredible photo for 1966 because he had a flash in color film. And, and so we sent, he said, let's, let's send, um, let's send a copy of this to coach Smith. So, you know, we sent a copy in which I'm sure he got a lot of stuff in the mail, but, but he was gracious enough to send a thank you note. And then with the note, which I've still got, he said, when our team pictures get completed, I'll send you one. And it was signed and, that started it. I mean, from then on, I just started, um, collecting programs, ticket stubs, photos. Um, and then I took that 
when my friend said, why don't you do it? Well, I said, you're crazy. Well, what happened, um, Tommy and Greg, is that with my late wife doing chemo uh, at Duke, she, I would, when she was doing treatment, I would go to the library and just start looking up stuff, basketball articles at UNC and at Duke, just to get my mind off of her, off of her illness. And one thing led to another. I started in 1911 in the microfilm at Duke and at, at UNC at Wilson also, and went through every season, every box score beginning in the first season and put together statistics and rosters. And one thing I was finding is, I'm sure both of you over the years have looked at in the blue book in the back of it where it's got um, the scores and the rosters underneath it from every season. I was kind of going by that when I first started and I got in touch with Steve Kirshner, who is most of us know is the uh, sports information, uh, athletic communications director at UNC. And I said, you know, Steve, I don't mean to sound presumptuous. Like I know everything cause I don't. Um, but I tell you, I, I'm going through these box scores and finding mistakes. Um, I'm finding that in the rosters listed in the blue books are players that are listed that were never in a box score. And then people who were in box scores aren't listed as having played. And then I'm finding mistakes in scores. And he said, he just said, go for it. He said, you know, you're not being presumptuous. Um, but I, I never wanted to sound like, uh, and I want to stress, I never wanted to sound like I'm the guy who could do this and, and I know more than anybody else and, and all these kind of things. It was just something I sat down and started to do. And, and then my wife passed away. And what, what happened is it became a grief project. And that's why when you say, gosh, there's so much in it. Well, there was um, many days that, that, that that's what got me up, that I had this project I was working on. And, you know, you mentioned my being a pastor. Well, I mean, I'll be honest, at that time in my life, having just lost my wife, um, it's difficult to get up on Sunday morning and preach a sermon and act like, you, you know, you're the person that's got it all together and, and um, all those kind of things and, and be the leader uh, when you're grieving. And I'm not saying you don't get back to that point. But initially, when you're grieving in that first year, um, I'll, I'll be honest, diving into these statistics was a whole lot more fun than writing a sermon, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Sure. Absolutely. It is, uh, I, I will say this, and then I'm going to let the smart people in the room get in it. Um, you talk about 1911, and you go deeper than 1911 because you start with James Naismith. And that's what's cool, was really cool to me, um, opening the book and literally starting at the beginning. Um, and, and you've got a copy of the rules and all that. And your picture that you mentioned, um, and then I'll get out of the way, is on page 13. So when people um, open up this book, when they get this book and open up the book, flip the page 13, and there's the color picture of you getting Dean's autograph and, and what started it all and culminated in this and we'll talk more about it as we go along but greg go ahead i will step aside briefly to let greg barnes jump in well first of all let me say this this is 472 pages um and this this is volume one it's from 1891 as tommy mentions there through 1961 so up to the point shaving scandal that, that kind of set the stage for, for dean smith uh, ron how many volumes do you plan to have uh, three volumes, uh, 1911 or 1891 to 1961. The second volume will be 1962 to 1997, uh, just Coach Smith's years. Um, we've debated on on as far as Coach Guthridge and Coach Darty should that go in the second volume or the third volume. And to be honest with you, logistically when you're doing 37 seasons on Dean Smith, 
it's going to be very difficult to add Coach Guthridge and Coach Darty to the end of 37 seasons. It's going to, I think, logistically, it makes more sense logistically and page number wise to do not, um, 1998 to the present because there's less seasons, mm. if, the, if you know right. what I'm saying. Right. Uh, and page wise, we're going to include Coach Guthridge and Coach Darty in volume three, along with Coach Williams and then Coach Davis. Okay. So. The when I first heard about this, and Tommy Tommy mentioned doing this podcast, uh, and, and the fact that it was going to be a couple different volumes. When, when I started thinking about how to tell stories, uh, you know, as a reporter, I like to talk to the people who can tell me about it. And so I had no doubt that you know, starting really in the 60s and beyond, yeah, you can talk to people who played and have good memories of Dean Smith and Roy Williams, and you can get a lot of storytelling that way. When I saw that this volume ended in 1961, I was kind of like, okay, it's going to be interesting to see exactly how he kind of fleshes things out. And the, the amount of detail, starting with 1911, that you're able to provide with uh, all these different people involved is fascinating to me. Uh, I cannot, cannot imagine the deep dive you had to do. But what I, what I really like about how you kind of address that, since you couldn't go back to 1911 and interview people, you did a really good job of finding newspaper articles and magazine articles and quoting uh, kind of the, the, the lingo of the day, which I, I just found fascinating as I'm looking through that. Walk us through that research project in terms of not only finding box scores and stats, but trying to trying to flesh it out, trying to add some some life to the pages. It, um, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Well, what was the term? Um, luck is the product of hard work, or whatever. Right. There was a lot of. There's always a lot of luck, but it's also hard work. And what I did was, um, I. I started in 1911, and now keep in mind, in 2005 and 2006, there was no newspapers.com, or if there was, it only had a few newspapers on it. Um, and so I was in the library at Duke and UNC going through the microfilm, whereas now I can go to newspapers.com and get articles, and it's much easier. Um, but in answer to your question, what... Um, what I did was I literally went through, got the Daily Tar Heel and went through every season, every day, which in those days, 1911, the teens, the 20s, there wasn't a Daily Tar Heel. It was the Tar Heel. And it was two days a week, maybe three. So what I, what I did was – I wanted to make sure when you're writing 1911 and 1912 and 1913 that you catch the uniqueness of each season because every season is unique. I mean, you know, just the past two seasons um, with COVID, you know, in 2020 and then 2021 and having a losing season in 2020, every season's unique. It's just a matter of sitting down and really going day to day through the newspapers and finding what's unique about it. I remember, um, and I'm not going to name names. There's no point. Um, but I remember a book several years ago that, that was out on UNC basketball and they tried to kind of go through each season. And I, I believe off the top of my head, it was 1914. They started out really good, but then something happened and they, they ended up having a losing record. I mean, it's just off the top of my head. Well, what in this book, it basically said, you know, they started out great, but then things went south and we don't know why they just did. And well, what happened was two guys flunked out of school and their two best players at mid season um, they didn't have enough hours credit or whatever. And they, and that's why the season went South after that. Well, to find those things out, you got to go through the paper every day to find the nuances and the uniqueness of that particular season. So 
that's how I did it. If that, that's your question, that's how I did it. Just, just grunt men trench work. I, I mean, one thing I did, even though John Bunning didn't have the greatest of seasons as UNC's football coach, I'm telling you with this project, I was constantly reminded of his, his quote of just keep sawing wood, man, just keep sawing wood. And I mean, I just kept, I just put my blinders on and just kept going and kept going and kept going. And, um, and then you just, you just find unique stories, anecdotes, which is the really interesting thing. Um, you bring up about, um, I mean, I'll just give you a little bit about what I'm working on now with this second volume I've just finished, but I don't really think you can write, um, the Dean Smith story, which again, this isn't going to be the Dean Smith story. It's going to be the seasons. And when I talk to, you're talking, you're asking about talking to various players. Um, what I, when I talk to various players, which I've been talking to, what I want to know is specific games. I want to, I want, I'm not, the Dean Smith story and the relationships with coach Smith. I mean, that's, that's been done. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. Absolutely. And I'm not, that's not what this will be about. This will be about Billy Cunningham talking about the half court shot he hit against Notre Dame to send the game into overtime and Bob Lewis watching the game on television, going back, looking through his boxes of letters and, um, you know, Charlie Scott talking about the Davidson game or, you know, Rusty Clark's rebounds against Maryland. I want to, I want stories about games. Um, and so what I'm doing in the second volume, and again, I'm not, um, I'm not talking about anybody else. Um, I want to be careful to say that, that again, what I've tried to do is, is go in directions nobody else has gone in because, um, I mean, I had somebody ask me, you know, why did you think you could do this? You know, were you not intimidated? And I said, you know, when you started, because because everybody's done so much on this subject. And I said, well, not really, because I have I had so many photos and so much unique stuff. It really wasn't intimidated. But my point is, in co talking about Coach Smith, I don't really think you can really do justice to writing about Dean Smith until you do or really dig into Fog Allen. And that's what I've done in this second volume is the first chapter heading into the 62 season begins with Fog Allen. And I'm telling you, um, James Naismith was the father of the game. He created the game. But Fog Allen, who played for James Naismith, which I'm sure you guys knew that, he's the, like, the father of coaches and – the father, as far as promoting the game, Naismith did not want it promoted. He wanted it just to be played at the Y. And, and Allen, as a 15-year-old in the early – in 1900, um, just saw this as an opportunity to be like baseball. I mean, this is a great game. And he started promoting it when he was 15 years old. And he, he had five brothers – and they were called the Amazing Allen Brothers. And they would travel barnstorm in the early part of the So my point in telling you that story is just like you're talking about Naismith and then Frank Mahan going to Charlotte and, you know, the beginning of volume one. The beginning of volume two is going to tell the story of Fog Allen and how that, how Dean Smith's father was influenced by Fog Allen in Kansas in the 20s. And then he, he influenced Dean Smith as a kid. And I don't think you can really tell the Dean Smith story without telling the Fog Allen story first, which is what volume two is going to do. And one of the fascinating things about volume one um, is the fact that it's not just rosters and stats and kind of, as you say, you this happened this season, so on and so forth. It's, it's fleshing it out. It's providing depth. Um, as you said, there, you have great anecdotes that tell stories. Every, every season is different. Every player is different. Uh, but not only do you start with James Naismith, you go through not just Carolina's seasons, but you go through kind of the formation of the ACC, the Dixie Classic. I mean, I learned – I knew about the point-shaving situation, 
uh, I did not know anywhere close to the, the depth that you went into, um, which was just a great way to kind of close the book. Uh, but I found all I that did, fascinating. I didn't either. I didn't either. And that's why I did it because yeah. I really dug because because I knew that the book was going to have to be closed with that. And I wanted to try to get it right because I all I knew is, is Ron Morris and what he had written in uh, Art Chansky and Ron in their book on the ACC. And Ron had done about the um, gambling and point shaving, but I hadn't really read I, maybe it's because I just haven't looked, but um, but what you're saying, as far as the um, the Doug Moe situation, the Frank McGuire and and it, it spending too much money on taking people to dinner and and just my limited knowledge, um, I thought it was all the point shaving stuff that kind of got McGuire to leave. I really. And until I really dug into, and I don't know if um, if you saw this or not, but um, what I did, and I hate to use the word I, but um, that's what we're talking about. Um, <laughs> but what I did was I, I connected all that to Howard Garfinkel. Did you read that? Yeah. That basically, that, is, uh... um, that that whole deal that happened in 60 and 61 with the NCAA um, investigating UNC started with Howard Garfinkel in 57 because he didn't get York Larisi. Mm -hmm. He was upset about that. And in Sports Illustrated, he said, I'm going to get back at those Carolina guys if it's the last thing I do. And that was really the foundation of the NCAA investigation. Some things never change. <laughs> That's right. I was about to say. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, uh, let me go back and, and – Y'all mentioned it and you talked about the depth of it. And you're right. I've read plenty of Carolina basketball history. I've seen box scores and rosters and stats and all that. Um, for me, and I'm a memorabilia guy too, um, ticket stubs, press passes, autographs, all that kind of stuff. It's all scattered throughout this room. Um, but it was fascinating to me how you went back like the first state game or the first championship game. And then the section on the 24 – um, national championship or the Helms uh, trophy that we've all heard about 57. If you're older than, especially if you're our age, but if you're older than 25 or 30, you've heard about 1957 in that crowd, but everybody sees the banner for 24 and they don't know a lot about it. Tell us a little bit about researching all of that, because I thought that was, is, it's all awesome and it's unbelievable. But that for me was a lot of, I learned a lot. Um, and I'm glad you went into depth in that because I think it's something that Carolina fans don't, they just see the banner and they say, well, that's another national championship. Just to explain that process, digging into all that as well. Well, first thing I'll say with the Helms Foundation National Championship in 1924, um, Kentucky has won. I think Kansas might have two, but none of them are taking down those banners and saying those championships aren't legitimate. Um, Carolina dominated the Southern Conference in the 20s. They won four championships. Uh, in that time, Kentucky didn't win any from 1921 to 1932. Um, but 1924, a couple of things on that, uh, and I probably won't get anywhere with this, um, but if you, if you really do the research, and I hope nobody gets upset with me saying this, but if you really do the research, Car Carmichael is one of the greatest players that ever played at Carolina. Um, and I say that because in 1923, the year before 24, they were 18 and 0 going to the Southern Conference tournament. And, the, and then they lost the second game in the Southern Conference tournament because he had the flu. So they went 18 and 1 in 1923 and then 26 and 0 in 1924. And he was the leader of both teams. He was the Larry Bird of his day, even though Jack Cobb led the team in scoring in 24. Um, it was, it was, 
Carmichael who set him up for a lot of baskets and he just did everything. And so in my humble opinion, I don't know if y'all knew this or not, but Jack, Car Jack Car Carmichael, because he was not national player of the year is not one of the jerseys up in the Smith center that is retired. Jack Cobbs is retired from 1926, but I would contend the reason Jack Cobb was national player of the year in 1926 is because Carmichael laid the foundation from 23-24 to get Carolina noticed. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Absolutely. That Carmichael's the one who got the school noticed and then Cobb benefited from that. And I'm not saying Cobb didn't deserve it. I'm just saying I think Carmichael would have won a nag. He was that good. And so that's one thing I learned from the 24 season is how good and, and you know, for the Washington paper, you may have read uh, the quote from the Washington paper that, that said Carmichael is the greatest player to ever step foot on a court in, in D.C. Um, and then also from 24, I didn't know this, that's pretty fascinating, that, that after they won the game that night and that crowd marched from Chapel Hill to Durham, that's when they started singing um, – the fight song. That was yeah. the introduction of the fight song in 1924. And um, um, was was that the first first time, kind of you know, after a big win, that the uh, the students rushed Franklin Street? To your knowledge, or you know, they may have done it in football. Yeah, um, but it's definitely the first time in basketball. And um, again, it, it's just fascinating to me. And I just don't have it in front of me here, but um, Tommy, if you could look up while you got that book in front of you, that chart that shows how many games Carolina won in the Southern Conference from 1921 to 1932, and it was so it's ridiculous as far as how far out front they were of everybody. I mean, they completely dominated the 20s, and again won four Southern Conference championship tournaments which in each one of those tournaments, there, there, there were 20 to 25 to 30 schools in the tournament. And it was the winning those four championships in the 20s is the equivalent of um, winning, a you know, winning a regional championship in our day. Mm -hmm. 26 and seven in the tournament in that span, four titles, 22, 24, 25, and 26. Uh, nobody else with more than one, Georgia, had one Kentucky, like you mentioned, none. Mississippi, Mississippi A and M, Vanderbilt, NC State, actually in twenty nine, and then Maryland. Quite a run for Carolina basketball, and, and that's why that twenty four season in that era is, for me, one of the major highlights of this volume. Is folks getting a feel for, you know, everybody thinks Carolina was dominant when Dean got there, and, and they were, but it started way, way, way before that. And you do such a, a good job at highlighting it. Between, let me ask you a holistic question on volume one. And, and this may be too broad of a question, but what was the neatest thing that you found out? Being a, a, a Carolina guy that has lived it, breathed it since early years, doing research, give me a few nuggets that you unearthed um, that we hadn't already talked about that were just like fast, most fascinating to you? I think um, just looking at and one, one thing that, I, that I'm aware of or, or really wanted to do with this, there's a reason that back in whatever year it was in the 70s, I think it was 1974, that People Magazine started. And the reason People Magazine, because people like to read about people. And so that's what I, I tried to do here is make this about people, not just scores. So you've got a bio for two or three players after every season, beginning in 1911. And so you, you just, I just found some fascinating stories. I think my favorite, um, is well there's a couple um one 
that from your hometown, Smithville, and and I just this was just a a lark, you know. I was um, I saw you know Bob uh, Rose was was nineteen forty forty one and forty two, and I just went. I was just. I mean, it was not like I knew anything about it. I just kind of in my head was thinking, well, oh, gosh, that's a that's about how old Ava Gardner was. So I looked it up and just said, well, as it turned out, they they were like date, you know, they dated Hi. and they were like an item, you know. And then I talked to Bob Gersten about it. And um he he told me you know, that that Bob Rose would bring Ava Gardner gardner to chapel hill to parties of course that wasn't too long before she went to hollywood Mm -hmm. um she hadn't been discovered yet but this is like 1939 that there you know so i got this picture that the smith from the ava gardner museum um of bob rose and ava gardner um in the book that was pretty fascinating um that i found uh and just again just trying to find anecdotes and stories about people Another of my favorites was um, the coach of the 1920 and 1921 team, Fritz Boyer. Um, he came to Chapel Hill uh, to, to lead the ROTC unit. He had served in World War I. But when you did a little digging on him, it, I found out that he graduated from West Point in 1916 I'm pretty sure it was 16. Um, and that that class in West Point is a famous class, and it's called the class that stars fell on because um, there there was a like a, the number of generals that came out of that class is a, is a record. Um, and as it turned out, they had all these guys coming out of that West Point class of 1916, and he was the the president of the class of 1916. And that class included Dwight Eisenhower and Omar Bradley. And this guy, Fritz Boyer, was the president of the class and Dwight Eisenhower was not. So I've got a picture, which you probably saw, of Dwight Eisenhower with Fritz Boyer when when Eisenhower was president um, in 1957, 58, something like that. but anecdotes like that, um, I love coming up with stuff. I love, um, you know, the 46 season was another one. People know about 57, but, and again, I just, I didn't know that much about 46. I just went and did the research and, and um, have a great picture of um, that, again, was just luck that I've got Bones McKinney, um, he's got his arm on the back of somebody in that game. And it just happens to be the, the, when he got his fourth foul, which changed the game. And then when he fouled out a minute later, you know, he said, you know, you called a good game except for that fourth foul. And there's a quote, you know, him quoted saying you called a good game except for that fourth foul. And I just happened to have find a photo of him foul, you know, having his hand on the guy's hip fouling him. Um, and let's see, um, you know, the whole, um, the, the, the Garfinkel story was pretty interesting about him being upset about, uh, and of course he became, as most of us know, follow back college basketball, know, you know, he became a, a, you know, did the five-star camp and, but in the mid fifties, he was nobody. And, um, and he got up, he was trying to make, you know, make his way as a scout and get noticed. And so he had York Larisi under his wing that um, he had him set to go to state. And Larisi ends up going with McGuire to UNC, and this gets Garfinkel upset. And um, any any stories that you guys remember you want to ask me about? Those are the, off the top of my head. Those are the ones I remember the most. Well, I was actually going to bring up the Ava Gardner part because when I was flipping through the book, uh, came across that page and asked my wife if she knew who that was in the picture. And of course she knew. Um, and the, the quote is from, uh, Bobby Gersten. I think the quote is fascinating. I think it's quintessential 1942, but says, I remember meeting her at a monogram club party. She was very lovely. 
And she came over and kissed me goodbye at the end of the night. Right? That's just, that captures the moment so much. Um, but in all these little sections uh, that deal with certain individuals from these teams, uh, like at the, like the end of, of Bob Rose's section, talks about what he did uh, you know, in the 1950s. He sold real estate. He went to Vegas, did some, some more real estate, retired in Chapel Hill. When he died, where he died, what age he was. That's for pretty much everybody. Uh, and so not only are you getting information about people that, that played on these teams, but you get some of these unique stories. Uh, and then you get kind of where they ended up. What did they become? And that just adds so much depth to it. Um, there's a number of things I wanted to ask you about, but I, I wanted to ask you about this because this, this guy seems to be all throughout the, the book, uh, the blind bomber. Can you tell us about him? Uh, UNC's first great player, um, all American national player of the year set the NCAA scoring record um, in the NCAA tournament in 1941. Um, I think that if they had been allowed in the NCAA tournament in 1940, they would have gone further. Um, Bobby Gersten, um, this is what Gersten said, and I have no reason to doubt it, but this is it's a fascinating story because I, I really hadn't paid any attention to this, but, um, but basically everything was played in New York City. And I don't know if you guys knew this. I didn't know it, um, but but um, I'm drawing a blank with uh, what's his name in New York City that that started everything in Madison Square Garden. Um, but he started the NIT in 1938. Okay, mm -hmm. and um, and because it was so successful, and what he had been doing. Um, with the NIT and, and Madison Square Garden double headers, that's how the NCAA tournament started. Okay. Mm -hmm. And is basically they were copying the NIT. Now, what's interesting, and I had not paid any attention to this till, till Gersten told me this story. When you're going through, like looking at locations for NCAA tournaments, early years, it's New York City. But in 1941, it's in Wisconsin. It's at the University of Wisconsin. And what Gerson said was the reason it was at Wisconsin instead of Madison Square Garden is there was concern that the Germans were, were targeting New York City uh, to bomb New York City. So they moved the tournament to, um, to Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, which would have been the Eastern Regionals, uh, the East, you know, the Eastern part of the, the tournament. So fascinating. Uh, it, it's funny we're talking about Mr. Rose and Smithfield and Ava Gardner. I really wish my father was alive to, to read your work, Ron. He would um, absolutely love it because, like I said, uh, he grew up around here at that time frame. So uh, it, it's just, uh, like I said, it, it's fascinating and, and a little bit moving thinking about it. Yeah. Tell us about... Um, an interesting aside to that, my wife's grandfather played in the Rose Bowl that was in Durham that was moved okay. there because of the uh, because yeah, of the war. Yeah. But uh, what um, tell us about the Everett Case Frank McGuire uh, rivalry, I guess if you want to call it, because that was probably one of the not modern day but close to modern day things that people that are around today still know about or still remember. How, how big a deal was that back then? Well, it was a big deal. I mean, I can get, um, I can, I can, the way that I would answer that question um, to, to shed new light um, instead of rehash. Um, I don't know if either one of you guys know that Frank McGuire is not in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. I don't know if I knew that. Uh, me either. Why would that and, be? And, well, that's that's where I'm headed with this. <laughs> um, and this, I'm just going to lay out the facts. I'm not going to speculate. I'm just going to tell you what I know. Um, 
uh, Everett Case, with the NC State program, was put on four years of NCAA probation, 1956, 57, 58, and 59. It's actually five years originally, but then they took a year. Um, NCAA graciously took a year, gave me a year back. Um, however, even though they were on four years of NCAA probation for the recruitment of Jackie Moreland in 1955, I believe, um, Everett Case is in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame and is considered to be just um, like a deity, whereas Frank McGuire is not in the NC North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. And um, the reason that has been given is because Frank McGuire, one of the criterias for being in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame is you have to have lived in the state for 10 years. Okay. Well, my research has shown um, that Frank McGuire coached at UNC from 1953 to 1961, nine years. He got here for the 52-53 season, and then he was here for 60-61, and then he accepted the Philadelphia Warrior job in August of 61. Now, the rest of the story is this. He was in Philadelphia for one year and commuted. And he had built a house in Chapel Hill, and his family still lived in the house in Chapel Hill. And then, from what I have found, that was 61, 62. And then they lived here until 63 in Chapel Hill. So that would have meant he lived in the state for 11 years. Um, so that knocks that whole 10 year thing out of the water. And I've already contacted the director of the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, along with other board members, and we are working on um, getting him in for the class of 23, because I personally think it's ridiculous that Frank McGuire is not in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. He, he laid the foundation for the North Carolina basketball program. Um, I love Dean Smith and I love Frank McGuire. I mean, Michael Jordan, but the foundation, and I'm sorry this is to upset anybody, the foundation is Frank McGuire. And Frank McGuire brought to the University of North Carolina Lenny Rosenbluth, Tommy Kearns, Pete Brennan, York Larisi, Doug Moe, Larry Brown, Lee Schaffer, and Dean Smith. Absolutely. That alone. I mean, that's the foundation of the basketball program at the University of North Carolina. Frank McGuire brought every one of those people to, to UNC. And you don't have to like him. You just need to give him credit for what he did. And um, so my point is, and, and when you ask about Frank McGuire and Everett Case, um, Everett Case was on four years probation at NC State, but yet they didn't have a problem at all with him being in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. And yet, for some reason, there are people who have a problem with Frank McGuire being in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame. Don't really understand that. That's fascinating there. Um, I, I did not know that was the reason for – I didn't realize that was a criteria. Um, but well, yeah, there, are it, people, there are people he rubbed wrong. Absolutely. And they're still, and they're still holding on to that. 60 years later, and I won't name names, but there are people who are still holding on to that. And I think it personally, I think it's absurd, you know, um, this so book. I'm going to throw something out, um, before you ask another question, you asked me about some unique or, or things that I remember. Uh, I think one of the, um, I guess highlights, of, of what not only did I, um, as far as digging into the microfilm, um, but I mean, I put a lot of time and effort in finding photos that have never been, never or 
just briefly been seen or maybe never been seen. And so I think my best find was uh, t 10 years ago, I was looking at the blue UNC basketball media guides, the blue books. And on the 1964 media guide, there's a color photo of Billy Cunningham uh, going up for a rebound. And I thought, gosh, that's the earliest caller that I've seen. And then I looked up who the photographer was. And it's, it, was a soci it was a professor at Chapel Hill who took this picture um, named Doug Sessoms. So I started looking for Doug Sessoms and he had passed away, but I found his wife 10 years ago and she had 250 color slides from the sixties. Mm. And wow. so those are photos. Those are images um, that are going to be used for book two. There's some of them in book one, but obviously, uh, and so two of the photos, uh, the, a, a fascinating story about the photos is that when, like when Tyler Hansborough broke the all-time scoring record in 2009, well, everybody knew that he was getting close. So you knew to be there with your camera, correct? Yes. Right. However, when somebody breaks a single game scoring record, you don't know to be there with your camera because you didn't know he was going to break the single game scoring record. Right. So in the sixties, nobody took color film. Uh, you know, if you're if the Durham paper, or the Raleigh paper, or the Charlotte paper is at a game, they're not taking color film because it's a waste of money because they're not going to, they're just taking black and white. So in December of 64, Billy Cunningham broke the single game scoring record against Tulane. And, and then a year later in December of 65, Bob Lewis broke Cunningham's record 49 points against Florida State. Well, Doug Sessoms was at both those games, and I've got color of Lewis breaking the record and then Cunningham breaking the record a year before. Uh, photos that have never been seen. Wow. That is uh, amazing. And I was just sitting there. This is what I've done since I got a hold of the books. Just flip through it and read and look. Um, the photos alone are, like you mentioned, are, are unbelievable. But you've got um, you know, newspaper clippings, the original ones. You've got ticket stubs in here and, and then the stories. Um, Ron, if you can quantify it, since this is, I agree with what Lenny Rosenbluth said. This is the the book for Carolina basketball. The Mona Lisa this, of the sports. The Mona sports. Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> That's what Lenny said. It may, it may be bigger than the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> <laughs> for Carolina fans, this is bigger than the Mona Lisa. But how how if you can quantify it, serious question, quantify how long you've spent doing this over the last 15 plus. Well, you know, it's um, – And how much of it is actual work versus a labor of love? That's the thing. Um, it One thing I haven't gone into is my dad. My dad was an artist, and he had a small ad agency, but he also painted and he oils and watercolors. And so he had a studio at our house, and so – as far back as my memory goes, I, I remember being in his studio and just drawing and playing around. And so that's in my DNA. I mean, it, it just the whole artistic thing. And so when this, this started, the, the goal all along was do something like Bill Wyman did with that Stones book. But I wanted it to be artistic. I wanted it to be creative and look really good and not just throw, throw photos on a page, but, and I'm not, I'm again, I'm not saying uh, I'm that good at it. I'm just saying that that's what I've been fooling around with since I was five years old. Um, and the only reason I didn't go in that direction as far as sports and layout and design and writing is because I was called into the ministry. That's where I was headed. 
And so in, in answer to your question, um, for 15 years, just um, what I did, Lee Pace's wife, Sue, is who designed the book. And my goal was, I told Sue, and I had a hard time finding somebody that understood what I was trying to do, is I would la I laid out the pages of what I wanted on it, photos, ticket stub, whatever. And I don't claim to be a, a des, you know, a, a graphic artist. Um, so I would show, I would give to her what I did. And I just said, Sue, now you take it and make it professional. You know, you make it look good with my idea as far as what's on the page. So in answer to your question about, I mean, I've just always loved designing and creating and, um, and so at the end of the day, probably I'll probably be lucky if I make a quarter an hour. Wow. <laughs> I mean, this was never about how much money can you make. It was always about, you know, I think we got the best program and I want to try to produce the best history of that program. And I don't claim to be, and I, I've told Art Chansky, I grew up with Ron Green Jr. Um, I've told these guys, Ron Morris, I don't claim to be a great writer. And, and But what I've tried to do is just kind of make it a creative kind of artistic kind of thing. And um, it's not page after page of words. Um, and when I was doing the research and doing the writing, the original idea was to, you know, Art Chansky and Ron Morris and Ron Green, you know, they were going to help with some of these seasons. And I knew nobody would really want to do the twenties and thirties and, you know, all that. So I did that myself and art would look over it and, and he would just say, this is fine. I mean, there's nothing here that I would change. I mean, and so I got into the forties and I, I mean, I could see, you know, the light at the end of the tunnel. I'm thinking, you know what, maybe I can just go ahead and do this. But it, that was never my intention. I mean, I was going to get others like Ron Jr. and um, to help. But then when they started encouraging me and saying, you know, you can do this, just I went with it. And um, I don't know how we got off on that. But um, no, it's, it's I'm, I'm fascinated to listen to the process because, like I said, I took the dust cover off because I didn't want to mess it up. It is an absolute fascinating Right. Uh, let's lay it out like this. The, the Frank McGuire years, which is chapter five, it's 170 pages and it's a big book. That could be its own book. I mean, that, that's kind of what we're talking about here. There's so much detail involved with just those, those eight, nine years. Um, but the fact that you've, we've got 500 pages here, that's got just so much incredible information. Uh, I, I'm not one, I, I'll be honest with you. I'm not one that's never been, overly interested kind of in in what happened years ago uh but the way the way the ron's put this book together is just phenomenal and uh I've, it is it's it's set up like a coffee table book just in terms of size and i don't know how many times since i've had the book uh last several days that i've, I've sat down and just flipped through pages and you start reading about one year and you go to the next and you, it kind of builds up so uh, it really is a, a fascinating read ron that the way you put it together, the you can tell the level of uh, interest. You weren't trying just to move through each season. There's intent with each single season, and I, I think it's fascinating. So, so job well done, um, and I, I think a lot of North Carolina diehards who, who are interested about the history of this program would, would find this to be a fascinating read. Well, it, let me respond because I echo um, what you're saying that um, as far as like, um, and I knew going in, especially with the teens and 20s and 30s, and, and that's why I tried to find as many ticket stubs and program covers and all those kind of things, because I know nobody wants to sit down and read page after page of words about 1920. I mean, I'm not, I know that, but at the same time, the, my thought process was that 
as much as I love Coach Smith and Michael Jordan and James Worthy and Bob Lewis and Billy Cunningham and Phil Ford, they didn't start the program. And yes, you could have, I could, no, from a marketing standpoint, absolutely, you start with 1962, you know, or maybe 1957. From a mark, if you're just trying to sell books, from a marketing standpoint, that's what, yeah, that's what you, you, but you got to tell the whole story. If you want to do the history, you got to tell the whole story. And I think there, there was enough memorabilia out there to make it interesting. But am I naive to think that everybody wants to read about 1925? No, I'm not. No, but, but I start, we started out saying, you know, we want to do the whole thing here. Um, and one thing, one story we haven't told, and, and you're talking about going back to 1891, you know, we just kind of glossed over it, but basically what happened is fascinating is that when Naismith invented the game in 1891, his class, it was the, the YMCA, uh, training school in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is now called Springfield college. And these people were training to go be directors of YMCA's across the world. And so, you know, he, he comes up with this new game. These guys graduate from school, 92, 93, 1892, 1893, then go to various YMCA's. Well, the person who was the leader of the class that ended up naming the game basketball was a guy named Frank Mahan. And he came, he went, went from Springfield to Charlotte and was at Charlotte YMCA from 1893 to 1899, teaching the game of basketball. That's why you see in these early years, if you ever take the time to go back and look at the scores, the Durham YMCA, the Charlotte YMCA, those were the best teams. And people look at those scores from 1910 or whatever and think, oh, well, gosh, yeah, of course they won games. They were playing YMCA. No, those were the best <laughs> teams because there was no NBA and there was no professional league. So the guys who played college then went and played on a YMCA team, and those were your best teams. The Durham Y and the Charlotte Y especially were, were really good in those years. So, so Frank Mahan goes to Charlotte, 1893 to 1899, teaches the game, and then four guys who learned the game from him ended up coming to UNC and they started the basketball program at UNC in 1910. So it directly, there's a direct linkage from the game being invented in 1891-92 to UNC in 1910. And um, so, yeah, it's... Um, that, I guess that's my response to what you're saying. Yeah. And, and beyond that, it's, it's James Naismith to Fog Allen to Dean Smith to Roy Williams yeah. to Hubert Davis, yeah. uh, which, is, which is crazy. It's fascinating. It really is fascinating, and there's a lot of, a lot of fascinating. Yeah, and so the next one, again, the Fog Allen stuff is, I think, and I'm not saying I, I just came up with several different sources where I found – good material on Fog Allen, but that could be a screenplay. I mean, can kind of do a Hoosiers thing with Fog Allen and how much of an impact he made on marketing the game. But then two guys who played for him ended up being the all-time um, wins leaders in the game. And that offer up and Dean Smith both played for Fog Allen. That could be a Hoosiers type of movie. Not that I could ever write it, but um, Fog Allen's story is fascinating, fascinating. And I'm a history buff, so. Um. Well, I'll, I'll say this. You have knocked it out of the park, to use another sports analogy. And, and it, is a, it is a great book. It is a must-have. People on Inside Carolina um, that follow the basketball team, uh, live and die with each basket made or missed, uh, need to pick this book up and, and need to get their hands on it and need to read it. Because like Greg just mentioned, you just mentioned, it literally starts with – day one of what we now call basketball 
Ron Smith, you've been a pleasure to talk to. Uh, when might we see volumes two and volumes three down the line? We got any timetable on that or is that top you know, secret information? My brother wants it. My brother's the marketing business guy. Um, I'm staying in my lane. If I have anything to do with the business aspect of it, this would have imploded. Uh, so, um, he wants it uh, out Christmas of next year, but I've told him, I just don't see that happening. Um, I think we can shoot for early for the basketball season, 22, 23, January, February. I mean, I've got my blinders on and, and really um, do, you know, and now I will say in this second volume, there's no way I can write 475 pages in this amount of time. So I've got others that are going to help write the seasons. Um, and I'll do the same thing I did with the other as far as layout, finding the photos, finding the memorabilia, writing probably 10 or 15 seasons. I just finished writing the Dean Smith um, part of the book, which is the beginning of it, how he went from, um, you know, Kansas to Air Force to UNC um, and just the beginning of his career and then being hired. Um, so we're shooting for the begin of, of winter 2023, which would be a year and four or five months from now. Um, well, it'll give people plenty of time to read this one cover to cover. And like you've done it, and like Greg mentioned, it's very easy to piecemeal it. It's not um, just word after word. It is, like I said, it, it is a great book. It's got a ton of information. It's got a lot of pictures, which I like. And uh, it's the Tar Heels. By Ron Smith. Thank you, Ron. Let me um, throw a plug out there. If you want to order it, it is we've we got various ways to get it. Um, the TarHillBook.com is where you can go. We intentionally have not gone with. Um, gosh, I'm I'm drawing a blank tonight. Um, what's the book place that everybody goes to? Barnes and Noble and places like that. Online, online. Oh, Amazon. Amazon. I, we right now we're not on Amazon um, intentionally. Uh, I'll just leave it at that. We've got our own website. It's simple to use. The TarHillBook.com. But we are going. We're at Park Road Books in Charlotte. We're at uh, Shrunken Head and Chapel Hill Sports. We're on Franklin Street. And I'm doing a book signing in Southport uh, Saturday at a gift shop in Southport. Um, but we'll be doing book signings all over the place. Um, we'll be at the bookstore and on campus for a football game probably in November. Um, but uh, either order online or we'll be in Greensboro. We'll be in – we're not going to have it blanketed all over the state. Um, one reason, because of COVID. I mean, it just um, – People are doing more buying online now. So we intentionally have really pushed our website. We're going to be at the, the Thanksgiving show in Raleigh, the Christmas show in Charlotte. Um, and like I say, the tarhillbook.com is the, the web address for you if you want to order it. Yeah. And you can also get an autograph copy on the tarhillbook.com. And yeah. And you, and, and mine's not autographed. So I need to catch up with you one day and, and get one of those. Definitely. Definitely. Yes. It has been a pleasure. The Tar Heel book.com, the uh, best Tar Heel basketball history book out there. And it's only volume one, volume two and three and beyond are coming down the road. Greg Barnes, I've been your host, Tommy Ashley. That's been Ron Smith. You've been listening to the Inside Carolina podcast sponsored by Johnny T-shirt, Johnny T-shirt.com. Thanks, boys. Much enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank Greg, Tommy. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thanks, Ron.